little lapel mic, so you good? Uh, I was actually talking to him. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. It's very nice to be in Oklahoma. Uh, when I left home, they were getting six inches of snow, and uh, it's somewhere around 20 degrees today. So this will be a very, I get to spend the entire week here in Oklahoma. It'll be very nice. Uh, I'm an engineer. I'm a planner. And unfortunately, I do math. And I started to ask myself, as I was as I was working as an engineer and a planner, I started to ask myself questions about why the projects I was working on didn't seem to make a lot of financial sense, and why our cities, even our cities that were experiencing really, really robust growth, were having such deep financial problems. I started writing a blog, and that blog grew into this movement of strong talent. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. For some reason, there we go. When we look back at the way cities have been built for thousands and thousands of years, we see a pattern that is very clear. Do you need me to use the podium mic? All right, just shut it off. I just feel more comfortable walking around. I'll do this. You, you, you're rendering me a, a little bit mute. I can still use my hands from here. <laughs> I can, but then I got... There's a balance issue. See, I'm... <laughs> so, cities have been built around a, a certain model of, uh, of building and development for thousands of years. If we look at, these are two artist renderings of ancient civilizations. The one on the left is a city called Ur. The one on the right is, of course, ancient Rome. They're built around the dominant transportation technology of the day, that, of course, being you two feet. People walked everywhere they went, and so the layout of the buildings, the distance between different types of uses, the way they would line up the streets is all very similar uh, to what you'd see around civilizations of people who walked. You can fast forward thousands and thousands of years up to, it was my hometown in the early 1900s. This is my hometown of Brainerd, Minnesota. I live a couple hours north of Minneapolis-St. Paul today. This is what it looked like in 1904. People would arrive here by train, they would arrive by stagecoach, but when they got to the city, they would, like people had for thousands and thousands of years, walk everywhere they went. And so the layout and the design, the way buildings were spaced, everything was very, very similar to what you'd seen for thousands of years. It's important to understand that the knowledge behind doing this didn't come from a university, it didn't come from a textbook, it wasn't theoretical. It was knowledge that was created the hard way by trial and error over millennia. People tried different things, what worked, they expanded on, what didn't work, they threw away. And when I say didn't work, I mean people died, civilizations went bad. People figured out through trial and error how to build cities around people that would last during good times, during bad times, during war, during peace, during feast, during famine. And they came up with a resilient model of building that was replicated worldwide. In the United States, we began a great experiment in building cities differently. This seems very normal to all of us today. This is the way things are, right? We look around and we expect strip malls. We expect residential subdivisions. We understand the hierarchical road network. We know zoning. It's important to understand that none of these things existed 100 years ago, right? None of these things were part of our conversation 100 years ago. The knowledge behind doing this wasn't developed by trial and error. We didn't try this out in Texas to see how it would work and then bring the best of it to Oklahoma, right? We just did this everywhere across the entire continent in one generation. We're now starting to understand that there are some implications to this that maybe the theoreticians didn't figure out when they came up with zoning and the hierarchical road network, that there's some implications to building in this way that maybe we didn't fully understand. Some of the financial implications are clear if you just do a little bit of basic math. Uh, this is a subdivision, uh, a kind of the most simple kind of building form that you can find. This is a dead-end road with a cul-de-sac. This was built in the mid-1990s. We did a financial analysis of this and looked and said, all right, 
based on the amount of money that the city is recouping from the property owners that live along this dead-end cul-de-sac, how long is it going to take them to recoup the amount of money they spent to build the road? Well, the answer is 74 years, but three times as long as the road would be expected to last. We see this again and again and again. Uh, go back one slide, if you would. There we go. This is a, another subdivision. Uh, you've got uh, kind of a closed loop system. It's not a dead end cul-de-sac, but essentially there's no through traffic, there's no commercial traffic. The only people using this are the people that live there. Go ahead and click this one. This was built in the uh, early 1980s. It completely fallen apart. The city went out and fixed it, $354,000. We asked the question, all right, based on the revenue the city's collecting from the people who live within this development, how long is it gonna take them to recoup what they just spent to fix it? The answer is 79 years. The road won't last anywhere near that long. So we said, all right, what if the city wanted to collect enough money from these property owners between now and the time the road fell apart to actually have the money to fix it? What would that mean? It would mean an immediate 46% increase in taxes with annual increases of 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this from now on, and that means go to the next slide. Uh, but you went two that time, so go back one. Thank you. Um, this is a commercial development. Sometimes people say, well, we lose money on residential, we make it up on commercial. We see the same exact pattern in commercial development that we see in residential development. This is a business park, kind of the build it and they will come investment. This was built in the 1990s. They came, the entire thing is full now. The city wants to repeat it, build the exact same thing right next door. We said, all right, uh, if we could do that with the exact same amount of money and get the exact same return, what would that mean? $2.1 million is what it would cost. $6.6 .6 million has been the amount of investment that came subsequently. If we were to take the revenue from that, the money that the city actually gets from that investment, and apply all of that revenue to repaying that debt, it would take the city almost 30 years, almost three decades, 29 years to break even. That's three decades where everybody else's taxes would need to go up, to pay, to mow the ditches, sweep the streets, provide fire protection, police protection, and every other service that would be needed. And that's in a wildly optimistic scenario that it would fill out within 12 months. What we're seeing here in our post-World War II pattern of development where government, businesses, and cities have come together to lead growth, to create growth, to create jobs, to create opportunity, is a very, very similar pattern repeated in cities all over this country. It's a pattern, and I apologize for the chart. I'm an engineer, I really like charts. Um, I'll walk you through this one. What this is, is a cash flow diagram of a new development. The new development goes in, the developer builds all the infrastructure, the developer builds the roads and the streets and the sidewalks and the pipes and the pumps and the valves. The developer builds the homes, the developer builds the commercial properties. All the costs of the infrastructure, all the costs of land are rolled into mortgages and long-term commercial loans. And the city, as part of this transaction, agrees to take on the long-term liability of maintaining all this stuff. We agree, when all this new growth comes in, that we as taxpayers will fix this stuff Forever. We'll be, if you think back to ancient Rome, you know, if we're going to be here hundreds of years, we agree that when these roads fall apart, we're going to fix them. When this pipe goes bad, we're going to fix it. This is what the cash flow looks like. In the very beginning, everything is brand new. And so it doesn't cost you anything, right? The money comes in. And in year two, more money comes in, and you add to what you had in year one. In year three, more money comes in, and on and on and on. A five-year-old road isn't costing you anything. A 10-year-old pipe isn't costing you anything. But what we find again and again and again is that when we get to, in this example, year 25, we get way out uh, on the end here when we actually have to go out and fix stuff. What we find is that the cumulative amount of revenue we brought in is insufficient. And from a cash flow standpoint, we run far, far into the negative. We lose money on these projects. Not right away. Right away we feel very rich. But over time, we lose money. The way we solve that insolvency problem, or at least the way we put off having to deal with that insolvency problem, is by generating more growth. Because growth gives us the illusion of wealth. Growth gives us the quick cash 
and the long-term liability. And so what do we do? We generate more and more and more of it. The deeper our financial problems get, the more desperate we become for more growth. This is that same uh, chart from the last one, but with new projects every year. So you're adding growth upon growth upon growth, and you can see your revenue starts to accelerate upwards. It starts to get this almost exponential curve to it. You've got all this new growth coming online. And when you get to year 25, the year you have to actually go out and fix that stuff from year one, you've got to spend a little bit of money, but it's not a big deal, right? You've had all this growth. The growth creates that illusion of wealth. And this is where there's going to be a little bit of timing for the... Because uh, as we all intuitively understand, if you lose money on every transaction, you don't make it up in volume. If you lose money on every project that you do, ultimately in time, the further you go out into the time horizon, the more downward pressure there is on your budget. This is why we see cities full of smart people doing all the right things, acting responsibly, following all the rules, doing all the planning, uh, you know, upsizing their infrastructure, not being cheap, doing all the right stuff, still facing enormous financial distress. It's not that our people are dumb. It's not that they're selfish. It's not that they're lazy. It's not that our governments don't work. It's that we have an experimental model of growth and development that financially doesn't work. This is why people smoke, right? We understand this as human nature. This is why people have a hard time exercising, right? I'd rather watch TV tonight, <laughs> you know? You get all the benefits today and the pain is way out in the future. This is the way we're wired. But it's important to understand that the traditional development pattern presented a check on that. It presented a check on that because we weren't able to borrow a bunch of money. We weren't able to get federal state grants to help us do things that we otherwise couldn't do. We weren't able to have individuals and businesses collectively finance enormous amounts of debt and pump into growth in our economies. We were forced to act more prudently because we didn't have other options. We didn't have other options. Today, with our affluence, we're liberated from a lot of those constraints. We're liberated from a lot of the things that held us back. And what it has allowed us to do is bury ourselves in long-term obligations. I'm going to do, because I, 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 I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide, but I, I want to point out to you just one little thing that uh, I was telling to someone today that they found incredible. Do you know that roads, uh, when they're carried on the city's books, are actually listed as an asset? If you go get a federal grant and build a $10 million new road so it costs you nothing, as a city, you're $10 million richer. Not you have a $10 million liability that someday comes due. You are $10 million richer today. The way we account for this stuff, the way we go about it, is all wired around a country of perpetual growth. And when we get down to the local level, local governments, it doesn't work. We're bankrupting our cities, and our best-run cities, we're bankrupting them because of the model that we're using. So how do we start to think differently about this? Build It and They Will Come is a fantastic movie plot. It is a horrible economic development strategy. This isn't how cities have created wealth historically. This is today. We're in what we call the desperation phase of the suburban experiment. If you are a city wanting to be competitive today, you've got to have shovel-ready sites. You've got to have infrastructure-ready projects. You've got to have a site. If, if Amazon comes to town and wants to put in their big warehouse, you've got to have a spot for them to go or you're going to lose them to the next city, right? So if we want to be a world-class competitive city, we've got to be there with the subsidies. We've got to be there uh, with the shovel-ready sites. We've got to be ready with all this stuff. This is the desperation phase. This is not how cities build wealth. I'm going to show you how cities build wealth. Uh, this is my hometown back in 1870. This was how it started. And you can look at this and say, all right, this looks like Oklahoma City back around the same time too, right? This looks like Tulsa. This looks like Dallas. Every city began, that began before this auto experiment 
started just like this. A bunch of little pop-up buildings. These were along the railroad line. But you could go to Manhattan, you could go to Paris, you could go to Rome. You'd see the same exact thing. They started with a little hope and a dream, right? And over time, when these places were successful, they would start to grow. They would start to grow in a very understandable, predictable, consistent way. They would start to grow incrementally up, incrementally out, and become incrementally more intense. And so after 30 years of development, those little pop-up shacks became this street that I showed you earlier, these two and three story wood structures. And after another 40 years of incrementally growing up, incrementally growing out, and incrementally becoming more intense, these two and three story wood structures would become these buildings with rock, granite, and brick facades. The way we build wealth is not by going to the casino and putting it all on red. It's not by having shovel-ready projects and putting millions out there to get ready for development to come. The way we build wealth is by making modest investments over a broad area over a long period of time. Let me show you how productive this approach to development is. These are two identical blocks in my hometown. The one on the left we've labeled old and blighted. The one on the right we've labeled shiny and new. Look at them. They, they are the exact same size, the exact same amount of public infrastructure. Everything about them is the same except for the style of building on them. The one on the left looks like this. It is uh, the 1930s version of the pop-up block. After these were built, we had the Depression, we had World War II, and then we had a completely different style of development that just skipped right over these and started building out on the edge of town. These buildings have stagnated as this infant form of that old development pattern for 90 plus years. Two blocks over used to look just like this. Uh, we had that torn down, and now we've got the brand new taco joint. Two lane drive through, big parking lot, got rid of the on street parking, now have some green space. Everybody likes this, right? What nobody bothered to look at were the financials. That old and blighted rundown block has a total value of $1.1 million. That shiny and new block, the same size, the same area, the same amount of public infrastructure, the same everything, has a total value of only $800,000. The city is actually getting 42% more taxes from that old development pattern. And we all know the trajectory of the taco joint, right? We all know that 20 years from now, there'll be a new taco joint a couple miles up the road. This one will be turned into a used car lot. 10 years after that, it will be boarded up and they'll be selling drugs out the back and the city will be looking for a grant to have it torn down and redeveloped, right? We've all been around long enough to see this take place. In fact, here's what's happened. We did this analysis initially in 2012. Here's what has happened in the two years subsequent to these property values. The traditional development pattern is incredibly productive and it holds its value over time. The new experimental way of building is financially a loser and loses its value relatively quickly. We see the same kind of thing on the edge of our cities. This is the Mills Fleet Farm complex. In Minnesota, we have uh, Mills Fleet Farm. It's a huge uh, big box store. This is a double size one with an auto dealership and a gas station. This is a 20 acre lot. It's the most valuable piece of property in the entire area. Uh, if you look at the core nine blocks of downtown, you've got the same size, roughly 20 acres. If you've seen the movie Fargo, you've seen a not so flattering uh, but not so inaccurate portrayal of downtown Brainerd. It's kind of a rundown, nasty place. Most of the third stories, second stories are unoccupied. A lot of the first stories see a, a lot of, you know, we've got the pawn shop, the dive bars, that kind of thing. Yet when we look at the value created in these 20 acre pieces of property, that shiny and new one out on the edge of town, we get $0.6 million per acre. But downtown, we're getting 78% more. Think about that for a second. We spent tens of millions of dollars to run sewer and water out to the edge of town, to put a bypass in, to do all kinds of stuff to create growth and development out there. And that stuff downtown was stuff that my great, great, great grandparents and their contemporaries built slowly and methodically over time. And all we have to do is maintain it. And it pays for us generation after generation after generation vastly more 
than what we're building today. I want to show you just some quick uh, maps. A good friend of mine named Joe Minicozzi uh, puts these maps together where he looks at the financial productivity of different land use patterns. What you're going to see now, this is in Buffalo, New York, one of the cities that were hollowed out after World War II, one of the places that we walked away from. What you are going to see in the vertical is value per acre, so the financial productivity of different land use types. Can you tell me where the traditional downtown is in this map? And look at it, it's not just the fact that it is more valuable than all the auto-oriented stuff we built, but that it is many, many multiples more valuable. The traditional development pattern, the way we have built around people who walk for thousands and thousands of years, financially destroys everything that we have built post-World War II. We see this in cities that are even smaller. This is one of about 45,000 people. We see the same kind of pattern. This is one near where I live. This is a city of 1,200. When I uh, started working with this city, they actually said, Chuck, uh, we want more of the stuff that you see out here. This is where our really good stuff is. And these are rundown old neighborhoods. We want you to figure out how to get rid of this stuff and build more of this stuff. Look where their wealth is. Their wealth is in those rundown neighborhoods. This wealth is in the places that they're walking away from. What do we do differently? We have to understand that in our rush to get the, do the, the, the dollars out on the edge of our community, we have walked away from opportunities to pick up the pennies and the nickels and the dimes that are laying there in plain view in our neighborhoods. Projects like this one from Memphis, Tennessee, where some people went out and took two blocks that were run down and dilapidated, put in crosswalks, put in bike lanes, just some elbow grease and some paint, swept the sidewalks, brought in some people to temporarily occupy some shops, took a really bad street and made it a slightly less bad street. Yet what resulted over the next year is incredible. 18 new businesses, millions of dollars of new investment, over two dozen new jobs. When I was out there six months after this project, every single building was occupied. We are walking away from simple investments like this because of the delusion we have that our wealth is going to come from these huge projects out on the edge. We put together a report in my hometown detailing 16 or eight projects that our city could do that would not only add value to the community but improve people's lives. Things like put a bike lane over here, put a crosswalk over here, trim some trees over here, plant a row of trees here. Little tiny things, $16,000 of investment in one neighborhood. Imagine if instead of spending millions of dollars out on the edge, which we're doing in my hometown right now to try to attract growth and development, we made modest little investments throughout all the neighborhoods. We know what these investments should be, right? I said to the city engineer, I said, um, you know, I think you could use a sidewalk through here. <laughs> you know what he said? Why would you say that, Chuck? <laughs> we'll never find the highest return investment sitting behind a desk, having a visioning session, doing a public hearing. We have to get out and look at our places. We have to live in them, we have to understand them, we have to walk them. And when we do that, thank you, when we do that, we'll start to understand where people are struggling and where we can make those modest investments to take the place just to the next step. If we do this, not only can we start to rejuvenate that incremental development process again and start to build financially strong and resilient places, but we'll also be improving people's lives in the process. Thank you so much.